in medicine and surgery. Dr. Carol Mbunu holds an, an MD in medicine and surgery from the University of Nairobi and a master of science degree in epidemiology from JQuart. Uh, she's an alum, alumni of the CDC Health Program Kenya and has a wide interest in research, particularly in the HIV infectious diseases and reproductive health programs. Uh, she's the deputy director of preventive and promotive health at Nairobi Metropolitan Services, a member of the Institute of the Management of Information System, Systems, uh, Lancet HIV, EAPAC, Commission on the Future for, of Urban HIV Responses, uh, 2020 and the Kenya Medical Association. Uh, Karibu sana, Dr. Carol, uh, to take us through the session. I'm Dr. Karin Gognes from Kenyatta National Hospital. For our participants, kindly put your questions and comments in the Q&A section and you'll be able to go through them at the end of the presentations. Karibu sana, Dr. Carol. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agnes. And I just want to welcome um, all our participants today to this uh, uh, session where we look at respectful care for newborns and young children. And uh, today we are going to have our session in two parts. Um, in the first uh, session, we'll be looking at provider knowledge and skills and emotional wellness. Um, and in the second part, and this will be experiences from Kenya, in the second part, we'll be having a presentation from Central. Uh, Uganda. So um, the first part, and uh, we'll just introduce the presenters for the first uh, session, will be uh, by Dr. Felistas uh, Makoha and uh, Charity Ndiga. Dr. Felistas Makoha Okwako is a consultant uh, pediatrician at the Bungoma County Referral Hospital and is currently pursuing a clinical fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine at the University of Nairobi Kenyatta National Hospital Program. She holds a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery degree from the University of Nairobi and a Master's of Medicine in Pediatric and Child Health from the Moy University. Her work has mainly focused on improving survival of premature and low birth weight infants through implementation of the Kangaroo Mother Care in Bungoma County and the prevention of mother to child transmission uh, of HIV as a co-chair of the Nyanza Western HIV Regional Technical Working Group. She's also part of the NEST 360 Facility Implementation Team, a NEST and ETAT Plus trainer, and a member of the Kenya Pediatric Association. Her co-presenter for that first session uh, is Charity Ndiga. Charity Ndiga is a program officer with Population Council, uh, Nairobi, in the Reproductive Maternal Child Health Program. And her main work is uh, to provide programmatic and technical support to a variety of reproductive maternal neonatal child health research activities that generate evidence for improved understanding of critical maternal health issues. Uh, working with others, she has developed and tested interventions to promote dignified maternity care during facility-based childbirth through the Heshima project. And she co-led the execution of the ending eclampsia project studies in Kenya and barriers to fistula treatment study in Uganda. Charity is currently coordinating one of the breakthrough research implementation research studies in Kenya that is seeking to improve experience of care for sick young infants aged zero to two years and their parents during hospitalization. She's also a co-PI in the urban health study that aims to improve maternal, newborn and child health outcomes for vulnerable populations in the informal settlements of Nairobi. Uh, so I want to welcome uh, this uh, team, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Magoha, uh, to go through our first uh, session. So Karibu Sana, uh, Dr. Felistas Magoha. Thank you, Dr. Carol Ngunu, for that present, uh, introduction. And I would like to welcome our presenters to the meeting today. Kindly project the slide. Or do I project from my own? So today we'll be presenting, Charity and I will be presenting to us on a study that we did in Bungoma and Nairobi just before I joined the fellowship program in Nairobi that is titled Enhancing Respectful Care for Newborns and Young Children 
through provider behavior change in Kenya, an implementation science study that was done in Kenya here from November of 2020 going to 2021. It was done in five facilities, two of them in Nairobi, in, in Bungoma, that is Bungoma County Referral Hospital and Webuye Hospital, and three facilities in Nairobi, that is Mama Lucy Hospital, Umwani Maternity, and St. Mary's Langata Hospital. And these two counties were chosen based on the fact that they have a high neonatal mortality rate above the national average of neonatal mortality. And to bring in a setting of both an urban and rural setting, so Nairobi was urban and Bungoma was rural. Next. So this is the outline of our presentation. I'll go through the background, objectives, interventions. I'll focus on the provider knowledge and practice results. And Charity will take us through the provider emotional well being and then summarize our presentation next. Next slide. My slide has not yeah. moved. Oh, just a minute, let us stop sharing that. I don't know, it's not moving. Just a minute, sorry. So as you go through that, even though there's a growing evidence around respectful maternity care and the studies around evidence showing what it means for mothers to experience care that is not standard, there is limited evidence around experience of care for newborns and young infants. And that is why we set out to do this study because there's limited evidence that exists on how newborns are treated in facilities, how to include their parents and families in the care while they are hospitalized in order for them to have a good experience of care in yeah. law and uh, it has moved. Thank you. Yes. In oh, Lawrence just a minute. Sorry. sorry, sorry to uh, to interrupt. Uh, we are requesting if you could adjust your volume. We are unable to hear clearly. Okay, let me increase the volume. Is it better now? Yes, a bit better. I'll try and project. So back to the slides, as I was saying, we have a lot of evidence around respectful maternity care, but there's li limited evidence around experience of care of newborns and young infants and their families, what experience they go through when they come to our facilities. So a responsive health system is supposed to be a health system that offers quality care. And for us in newborn practice, if we are going to offer quality care, then you must be offering care that is evidenced, having standard guidelines that are evidence-based. And uh, these guidelines, apart from being evidence-based, you must also have an actionable information system where you are able to pick out uh, babies while they don't care to be able to respond to the needs of those children quickly. In addition to that, there should be a function referral system because we know sometimes babies require care beyond what the lower level facilities can be able to offer. So having a functional referral system is very important in the newborn care setting. In addition to that, for you to Am I audible? Yes, actually now we can hear you. This is about a bit better, please project. Okay, so a quality, um, a responsive health system is one that offers quality of care that is being evidence-based, being uh, having an actionable information system and a functioning referral system. 
in terms of experience of care, in order for those who are receiving the care that we are giving to them to have a good experience of care, then there has to be effective communication, meaningful participation by the families. We need to show them respect. We need to protect the babies. And the care has to be one that fulfills the children's right. In addition to giving that care, we need to also provide emotional and psychological support to those families. This requires that you have competent, motivated, and empathetic human resource because how the human resource that attends to these babies are is very important. In addition to having a good human resource, then you also need to have the necessary physical resources that the babies need. And this will result to having good outcomes both at individual level and facility level. It will improve coverage of the key newborn indicators and result in the reduction in the, of the newborn neonatal uh, mortality rate, which we know as Kenya, our neonatal mortality rate has been high. So when we are doing this study, we looked at the seven core neuroprotective family-centered developmental areas, which are the six elements of nurturing care, namely partnering with, with families, optimizing nutrition, protecting the, the skin, minimizing stress and pain, safeguarding sleep, and positioning and handling. The study was done, next slide, the study was done in two phases. So we had a formative phase, and in the formative phase, we set out to understand the experience of care that newborns and young infants, zero to 24 months, and their parents were experiencing in these five facilities. And we were to use the information that we obtained in the formative stage to design an implementation research to see whether we could improve that experience that we had found out in the formative study. So then in the implementation research, our objective was to assess the feasibility and effectiveness of carrying out a pilot study that was targeting structural and provider behavior change interventions and approach to improve facility-based experience of care of parents and newborns and young infants that are admitted to these five facilities. Next slide. So from the formative studies, we got the following responses. And the responses from the formative study were published early this year in February 2022 in a paper titled Manifestations, Responses and Consequences of Mistreatment of Sick, Newborns and Young Infants and Their Parents in Health Facilities in Kenya. So from the in-depth interviews and the focus group discussions with the parents, with the providers, and the key stakeholders, the med soups, the nursing officer in charges in these hospitals, the findings that we got from the formative study, when we now looked at the actual mistreatment, we got the mistreatments that we were able to categorize under five categories. And we adopted these categories from a typology of mistreatment by Megan et al. that was published in 2015, looking at mistreatment of women during childbirth. So we extrapolated that and used that to categorize our mistreatment. And some of the mistreatments that uh, parents reported included in the category of failure to meet professional standards and health system, there are those parents who reported their babies having had delayed care, having had non-consented care, lack of equipment. In the area of stigma and discrimination, some parents reported that they felt their babies were discriminated because of their low socioeconomic status. Physical and inappropriate practice, some parents reported that they thought their babies were not handled well especially exposure to pain when babies are pricked repeatedly in search of IV access and taking samples, laboratory samples. There was also an element of poor rapport 
where we had poor communication between providers and uh, parents. And bereavement and posthumous care, where some parents, especially those who lost their babies, reported that they felt they were not uh, well supported and counseled when they lost their babies. Next slide. So in the pathway of mistreatment in a health system context, the drivers of mistreatment, what can cause uh, patients to be mistreated will be from a, a system and policy level or an individual level. So from a system and policy level, if you have a health system that has inadequate equipment and supplies, insufficient uh, competent human resource, inadequate accountability, that can drive mistreatment. At individual level, if you have staff that have poor attitude and behavior, if you are having poor communication within the facility, if you are having inadequate information being given to the parents, so the parents end up making conclusions on their own. If you are not involving them in decision making, then those can drive mistreatment. And that mistreatment can manifest in a form of physical abuse, poor rapport between providers and parents, ineffective communication, verbal abuse, poor bereavement care, wrong diagnosis and drug dosage. And because of that mistreatment, you can have temporal responses which can take the form of, there are those parents who can just feel sad and keep quiet, in order to avoid conflict between them and providers. But some of them can be assertive and we have had instances where you get uh, families, parents, mothers exchanging with the nurses or uh, the clinicians when they think their baby has not been well taken care of. Sometimes even making decision to have discharge against medical advice or sometimes having permanent psychological and emotional distress and vowing never to go back to that hospital again because of the experience they had. Next slide. So we came up with a theory of change. We developed a theory of change from the findings that we got from the formative study literature review around manifestations of abuse and stakeholder discussions, especially with the nursing officer in charges of the newborn units and the hospitals where this study was implemented. And we had three intervention areas, which we envisaged that if we were to carry out these three interventions, we were going to have a health system environment that was going to have improved efficiency and feedback within facilities, we are going to have informed, motivated, and supported providers, and that it was going to result in improved parent-provider interactions that will enable these health care providers to provide responsive care, nurturing care elements, looking at the six elements, optimizing nutrition, protecting the skin, minimizing stress and pain, safeguarding sleep, and positioning and handling. Next slide. So this is how we operationalized our theory of change. As I mentioned, we had three action areas. So in the first action, we had uh, interventions targeting providers. So we had provider orientation, peer-to-peer -peer support and emotional support for providers. So we took them through training on nurturing care elements, how to make sure that the care we give is giving all those elements of nurturing care. We went through organizational characteristics to see how we could work around the structural issues around the newborn units to be able to offer uh, good care. We had provider behavior uh, sessions where we had unpacking of values, beliefs, and attitudes amongst uh, healthcare providers. 
Then we had uh, sessions with the providers on how to handle provider parent communication, how to engage the parents in decision making. But we also know that healthcare providers, how they interact with the clients is largely influenced by their emotions. So if you come from home and you're angry, chances are high that you will handle a patient or a, a mother in a way that is not good. So we went through emotional support for providers in order to help them to be able to identify stress and burnout and how to go around it so that it doesn't influence how they interact with the parents. For the parental intervention, we had uh, coaching and an emotional support for parents. We used job aids to coach parents on the elements of nurturing care how to involve mothers and fathers in the care of their children. And we use the DEP guide, which uh, Charity will take us through on how to reduce distress, to give emotional support and partner with parents in the care of their children. In the last intervention, we had monitoring for structural change. So we wanted to see whether the changes that we have made had made an impact. So we had feedback on the quality of care where we had provider feedback forms, providers giving us feedback, parent feedback forms in a, in a form of like exit surveys on how the experience of care they had. And we had periodic meetings between the providers and the hospital managers to just discuss about the progress of the study, where they will document the changes that have taken place and identify additional solutions to the challenges that were arising. Next slide. So these are some of the job aids that we used. Most of them were MOH uh, tools that we used to do. Communication during hospitalization, how to involve fathers in the care. And then the topics on the six elements of nurturing care, we went through, through all of them. And there were videos that were available on YouTube that we used to train the providers on elements of nurturing care. Some of them translated in Swahili just to make them to understand better. Next slide. So these are some of the assessment methods that we used. As I mentioned during the formative stage where we set out to find out the experience of care before doing the implementation research, we had mixed methods like in the interviews to the providers and the policy makers. We had focused group discussions with parents. We had uh, non-observatory uh, observations, non-participatory observations in maternity, postnatal ward, and newborn unit, just to see how the care was uh, being delivered to the people. And now for the providers, we had a quantitative survey with healthcare providers in maternity, postnatal, newborn, and pediatric ward. And in terms of monitoring, we used mixed methods where parents were giving, uh, were taken through a, an exit interview. And uh, for providers, we had inter-provider feedback where Providers gave feedback about uh, their fellow providers on how they were engaging parents and providing the quality of care. In the end line, we had mixed methods where we also had in-depth interviews and survey with providers. Next slide. So these are some of the results from the implementation research second uh, phase of the study. So from the provider end line survey and the in-depth interviews, we looked at the six elements of nurturing care and we were looking at the newborn zero to the newborn period and then the children aged zero to 24 months in the pediatric ward. And we saw that there was a significant improvement in the knowledge of the providers on almost all the elements of nurturing care, except in the areas of optimizing nutrition and safeguarding sleep. And this was mainly influenced by like safeguarding sleep 
given that most of our newborn units are open bay, we don't have newborn units that are single family room newborn units. So it was a bit difficult to have safeguarding sleep being well implemented as per the standards, because there's a lot of traffic and, new, and movement and alarms within our newborn units. So safeguarding sleep is one of the elements that didn't do well. So a provider in the in-depth uh, uh, interview reported that from the newborn unit, that before the training in November 2020, they only knew about kangaroo mother care, but they didn't know much about the nurturing care. But after going through, through the training, they are able to uh, communicate well with the parents and uh, offer the six elements of nurturing care. Next slide. For provider reporting on peers interacting with the parents, we also saw uh, varied interactions with the most, these are percentages and the newborn unit had uh, higher percentages in almost all the elements of nurturing care. Comparing newborn unit pediatric ward and maternity, newborn unit did better. And this is because newborn unit has been having the kangaroo mother care programs and they have been doing more family centered care more than these other areas of uh, young child care. And uh, we had a lower percent in the area of play and cognitive development. And this was mainly because of the fact that a lot of those uh, pediatric ward do not have a play area there is a big shortage of staff, especially the nursing care. So the nurses tend to do more of clinical work than really take time off to go and play with the children. So the areas of safeguarding sleep, play and cognitive development did the, the lowest in the elements. Next slide. So for parent, follow-up survey, about 90% of the parents reported having been counseled or coached by providers on how to take care of their sick children. I remember in the pediatric ward, fathers really finding it uh, new to them on how to interact with the babies, talk to them, things that they never used to do before. So we had a uh, Majority of the parents reporting that they had been talked to about how to engage with their children, which we know is uh, very important in child development. Uh, the, the modalities of how the provider was engaging the parents differed. In the newborn unit, a lot of it was group mentoring, whereas in the pediatric ward, they tended to have more one-on-one -on -one, uh, encounters between the providers and the parents. And looking at the duration of the interaction, the length of the interaction with the parents was uh, every one to three hours in a day, how frequently the parents interacted. And the duration was also little, just like 10 to majority of them being under 10 minutes. And this is highly reflective of how a lot of the staff shortages that we have impacts on the time that the uh, technical staff can take off their time to really engage the parents. So if the, we believe that if the staffing level improves, then even the, the providers will have more time to engage with the, provide, with the parents. Next slide. So what motivated uh, the providers to implement interactive and nurturing care? About majority of them reported the fact that there was uh, there were intervention job aids and 44% of the providers reported using at least one job aid. The most widely used job aid was the MOH clinical guide for child development and the uh, availability of videos that they could watch on the elements of nurturing care was also reported during endline survey as a motivation for them to provide nurturing care. 
So 75% of the providers reported having watched at least seven out of the 12 uh, videos. And the most uh, watched videos, uh, a video about keeping babies warm, carrying the baby skin to skin, that was the most frequently watched. The least watched was the video on non-pharmacologic measures on reduction of pain, which was only watched by 25% of the providers. But close to 80% of the providers found peer-to-peer -peer support also very important. And they reported during the end line survey that those monthly meetings that we are holding between facilities to interact and share how the implementation was happening was really very helpful to them. Next slide. So it, as uh, providers in-depth end line survey, one of the things that came up is having a supportive environment in order for the providers to be able to implement nurturing care. So, Three things came up. One was orientation and self-learning. Providers reported that doing orientation for new staff who joined them and those who are not there during the training and even to each other helped them to be able to continue implementing nurturing care. And as I mentioned, the monthly virtual meetings that we held and interacted between different facilities enable them to share the experience. So Anas was quoted saying, I interacted with other facilities, we could share experiences and the videos, we could see what other facilities were doing, which was very benefiting and educative. Accessibility to the intervention materials, that is the soft copy videos, enabled the providers to follow up on the lessons that they had learned during their free time. Next slide. So interventions associated with the parent outcomes, we did a regression analysis and the controlling for parental age, the child's age, the diagnosis, duration of stay in the hospital, and whether the baby died or not, we found that there was a significant uh, association between parents who were informed about nurturing care and those who did not. We found that parents who received information during hospitalization on nurturing care were having higher levels of ability to provide nurturing care. Their interpersonal communication with providers was found to be better than those who had not. And parental empowerment in caring for their newborn or young child was significant for those who had received information about nurturing care compared to those who had not received any information. Next slide. So in summary about provider and uh, parent interaction, this pilot on structural and provider behavior change intervention uh, approach to respectful nurturing and responsive care was feasible to implement in the Kenyan setting and provider targeted intervention is associated with parents' experience of care, interpersonal communication with providers and empowerment for them to take care of their hospitalized children. There's a significant difference between the newborn unit and the pediatric board on how they provide information to parents about nurturing care and how they interact generally. For sustainability purposes, we involved the providers and the managers within this facility. And therefore we believe that this is a, an intervention that is sustainable and can continue even after this study has come to an end. So this is a promising practice that we think other facilities, including KNH, can take up and having parent feedback forms can be institutionalized even in our newborn unit in Kenyatta for us to find out what is the experience of care of the babies that we take care of here and be able to self-evaluate ourselves where we can improve 
And this can be implemented even using virtual because we did this study at the peak of COVID and therefore a lot of interventions were done virtually. Meetings between Bungoma and Nairobi happened virtually, but it is doable that you can work even with the people who are not on shift, the ones who are off shift being able to be involved, to be able to uh, implement this as a good practice within our facilities. So thank you, and I would like to welcome Charity to take us through the provider emotional support. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Makoha, and afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, let me have the next slide, please. Uh, 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 our next set of slides will focus on the results from our uh, provider wellness uh, intervention. And uh, uh, I'm going to take you through in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, please move on to the next slide, please. Our emotional support components aimed to enhance provider capacity for self-care, reflection around their own stressors, achieve work-life balance, and cope through interpersonal communication. I'll also be able to support uh, parents, as Dr. Mako has just said. And to do this, this was part of the training that uh, was mentioned earlier. And for, 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 the, for this particular intervention, we had two job bits. We had a job based on uh, parents' emotional wellness uh, that was to assist uh, 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 providers identify parents, uh, parents when they have a, uh, 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 experience seeing anxiety, have fears, concerns, and provide them with, with emotional support uh, and also mitigate the stress. Uh, uh, and uh, we have questions here on the right hand side so that providers would ask parents. And also on the right hand side, there are tips on how the provider would help the, 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 the parent or the families uh, cope with, with the stress. For example, in case of pain, uh, you know, uh, the provider would ask uh, uh, how the child pain is right now, would ask the parent how the, the pain is right now, and then would help the parent understand what is happening with the, with the child at that particular time and also allow, uh, explain to the, to the uh, uh, parents how to use uh, some uh, uh, coping techniques such as breastfeeding, uh, uh, non-nutritive non suckering, uh, uh, you know, and also swaddling among other things to reduce the stress. For the emotional uh, uh, wellness uh, 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 technical um, uh, job aid, we call it the ABC, the ABC of the provider self-care. Uh, and uh, the A is for the awareness. Uh, this is where we are, uh, the providers are orientated on how to be aware of how to react to, to stress. Are they overworking? Are they uh, feeling exhausted? Do they have bubble outbursts? And uh, also be able to monitor what was stressing them and set limits between parents and their colleagues and also uh, know when to uh, seek care uh, either from a, a professional counselor or you know uh, advice from their manager uh, if they find that that stress is affecting their uh, life or relationship. The B is for balancing work and, uh, and uh, uh, other life and uh, you know we encourage them to take uh, uh, breaks during uh, work days uh, eat plenty bread, take uh, regular exercises, and also get enough sleep, engage with activities outside work, and also use their leave days uh, at, uh, as a way of coping and balancing uh, work and uh, work life and uh, uh, their uh, uh, dealing with stress. The C is about connection, and uh, we it, it, the job aid advises on uh, providers to connect regularly with families, friends, and community. Also use uh, healthy ways of uh, relaxation, such as uh, prayers, meditation, and uh, not when not on work, to try and completely disengage from work. 
uh, through, e through uh, emails or WhatsApp messages that are about uh, their work. Uh, let's move to, to the next one, please. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, what did you do to understand uh, uh, provider mental health and support? Uh, we use both quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, methods. And for the quantitative method, we had a provider survey at baseline and end line and used three tools, uh, uh, the master burnout inventory. This is a global measure with three domains, emotional exhaustion, uh, depersonalization. This refers to when someone is just feels impersonal, uh, a bit disconnected and, and emotionalist in, in terms of the way they are dealing with the, with the, with the parents or the sick child. And then professional accomplishments refer to provide that feeling that they are uh, 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 competently accomplishing the task that they are, they, are, they are doing in offering care for the sick child and the, and the, the, the parent. Uh, the other tool that we used was uh, uh, depression. We used the PHQ-9 uh, tool that has several questions that ask about uh, how, how the provider is feeling. Do they feel, for example, do they feel like, like they have lost sleepless or pressure in what they are, they are doing? Are they feeling raw? Are they feeling raw? And uh, um, in the worst case scenario, are they feeling like uh, they, they are useless or they want to harm themselves? And therefore, uh, if they answer those questions, then we, 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 we uh, analyze that data that way. Then the post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental health condition with varied symptoms, such as uh, flashback and nightmares. And uh, this, this too has five screening items. Uh, for example, are the, uh, the, were the providers, we asked them whether they were experiencing any nightmares. Uh, based on uh, uh, a stressful experience that they had had before, uh, had they tried to think or avoid the situation, uh, and also um, do they feel numb or you know, uh, or going to attach to detach from uh, such activities, uh, or do they feel guilty and unable to uh, and feeling like blaming themselves? And uh, those are the three. Uh, uh, tools, uh, methods, or uh, um, measures uh, that we, we applied in uh, the quantitative survey. For the qualitative uh, interview, we conducted in-depth interviews on how the emotional support intervention component was experienced by the provider in the five high, in the five facilities across the two counties. And then uh, we also wanted to find out how the emotional support components affected the provider's ability to cope with stress and interact with parents and uh, newborns and young infants. Uh, let's move on. So how does the psychological well-being of the providers affect uh, uh, the, the, the health care, the quality of care the health service providers are offering? Provider stress affects performance and quality of care. And uh, uh, we find that personal and work, uh, we found that personal and work stress can demotivate providers working in under resourced and high stakes hospital settings. For example, a provider here seems to feel that if they are overworked and not motivated, and uh, they also have some, one is experiencing some family issues, this is likely to affect or interfere with the quality of care that they are offering. Uh, uh, burnout and stress can also hinder the necessary collaboration between staff and uh, supervisors and result in, uh, in conflict. Uh, one provider here seems to say that uh, if you are, if you are uh, experiencing burnout, you will not be able to, co to collaborate with others, you end up doing your own things, you will not even ask for help, you end up losing your temper, and you will not be able to communicate wisely. Uh, so this is how uh, the, the, the effects on, on uh, burnout and stress was reported on how it affects quality of care. Let's move on to the next one, please. Next, please. Providers reported uh, experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. And we see that um, 
providers in Opidu, the dark brown one is OPD, uh, about 20% of them experience uh, uh, PTSD, while 12% in uh, the newborn unit uh, experience uh, uh, PSTD. About 3% experience severe depression, and many of the providers experience uh, 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 minimal depression. We see about 80% of this in the, in the, in the OPD unit and about uh, uh, 30 and that, uh, about over 30% both in NBU and the, the PID ward were observed to, uh, or the results showed that they experienced mild depression. In these two quotes, we see providers that were experiencing depression. One said that they actually felt like committing suicide and was actually very grateful that the private counselor came in timely and even reported that if the, uh, the counselor didn't come, they don't know what would have happened. And uh, happy to report that these two providers are, uh, were linked with the uh, uh, counselor and continues to receive care. The other example here, we see a provider who had confided with uh, uh, her colleague at work that she uh, of a HIV status. The, the same provider got uh, COVID and was very sick. And when she reported back, her colleague said, uh, uh, you know, talked, uh, told her that you are COVIDed now, just continue with PEP. And she felt extremely annoyed and uh, stigmatized and she kept to herself. So this was uh, some of the examples that uh, we, we will share on uh, how uh, the providers were experiencing uh, depression. Let's move to the next one, please. So one set of uh, intervention are effective in improving the mental health of care providers. We had both uh, group counseling sessions, like you can see here, uh, to start with group counseling sessions were occurring virtually because of COVID, but we moved on to face-to-face -face, and this is one of them. We also have had one-on-one -on -one sessions for providers that required or had uh, problems that uh, needed one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, initially we started virtually, but also moved on to face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. And also we had referral of mechanisms where uh, they were linked with uh, institutions such as the KNH uh, and other uh, uh, area uh, um, services or institutions where the providers chose to be linked to. Uh, let's move on. Next slide, please. Uh, we see that uh, due to the intervention, we see the reduction in provider burnout. Uh, for example, we see a 20% reduction of emotion, emotional uh, exhaustion between baseline and headline, and about 5% uh, or a reduction in depersonalization, uh, but we don't see a lot of change in uh, personal accomplishments. Let's move on. Move on to the next one. Emotional support components support the providers to manage stress. This is what the providers reported. They, they reported that they had improved self-awareness. They're also able to recognize source of, of, of stressors and were able to, uh, also to understand the different coping mechanisms. About 9% of the providers that uh, attended, that were interviewed, attended a psychological debriefing meeting, and 23% of them reported using a DBE guide. Uh, but while virtual sessions were, were, can work, providers seem to prefer uh, in-person debriefing sessions. You can see a provider here in this quote talking, uh, that, saying that the DB guide was helpful as it helped them determine when they were stressed and also where, how, when they were supposed to take action in margin, managing their stress. A uh, doctor here seems to say that uh, um, they prefer one-on-one -on -one session because uh, during the one-on-one -on -one session, the counselor is able to read the body language uh, expressions of the, which could be an expression of stress and therefore offer the appropriate uh, services. Move to the next one, please. Uh, stress and burnout has influence on teamwork and patient interactions. 
And also, uh, we see that when we employ this intervention, but when these are integrated with broader health system quality of care improvement, emotional support promotes better teamwork, which is necessary for uh, good quality of care in clinical settings, such as those one in NBU and pediatric ward. And uh, you can see uh, some examples here that um, uh, team members, because of using the DV guide and being supported emotionally, they were being able to reach out to uh, other members and partner with them. And this was very important. And uh, this particular doctor reported that they, they knew when to call out for help so that they can balance out things. I mean, when they felt that they were overworked or overburdened. And in another facility, a provider reported that they, they became less defensive uh, because they were such an open environment and they, they were not blaming each other or trying to undercut each other. So uh, they were much more comfortable in giving and receiving feedback because of the interventions that were received. We also see that the providers improve skills um, uh, on counseling patients, especially on how to communicate uh, and support parents who are believed uh, uh, from losing a child. A uh, provider from Nairobi here seemed to say that she learned that she would only say sorry, but uh, due to the, to the training that she received, she learned that uh, saying sorry was not enough. Let's move to the next one. So in summary, we see that provider mental health is an erected area, provider faces stress and burnout, and depression that may affect their interactions with their families. Emotional support intervention targeting providers can lead to reduced burnout, better coping with one's own stress and enhanced interaction with peers. And also uh, providers are able to be sensitive to parents' psychological needs and address them. Uh, uh, our uh, intervention or our study was not without a limitation, and one of the limitations was COVID-19 that affected our intervention modalities and exposure. For example, we were not able to go to the sites and see what was happening, conduct uh, more of face-to-face uh, -face counseling sessions, and also this may have, uh, may have uh, affected our outcomes and also our data collection processes. Most of this data co uh, corrected, uh, was collected on phone other than the formative study because of the COVID restriction. Uh, but all in all, we see that implementation research is a promising approach to collectively identify co context specific solutions uh, to enhance healthy healthcare system and promote uh, quality of care. And just to talk to God, you cannot improve quality of care if the providers' well, well, mental well-being and their, you know, uh, other human resource needs are not uh, well taken care of. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, that brings uh, us to the end of our uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Makoa and uh, Charity for that very um, informative uh, presentation on the work that is ongoing. Um, we now have a presentation that will be given to us by Philip. I can see there's already some questions on the chat, but we will have a Q&A session where the presenters will answer the questions at the end of all the presentations. So I want to welcome uh, Philip. Um, Philip Wanduro is a research fellow at the Makerere University School of Public Health and uh, Institute and uh, Makerere University in a double degree arrangement. He holds a master's in public health and a bachelor's in clinical nursing. And um, his doctoral research is focused uh, mainly on the quality of care, predictors and consequences of hypoxia, uh, hypoxia ischemic insults in infants. He is also a research fellow at the Center of Excellence for the Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, where he has worked with hospitals in Eastern Uganda for over six years to enhance the quality of care for mothers and newborns at time of birth. So I want to welcome uh, Philip Wanduru, who will take us through the presentation on respectful maternal and newborn care in the newborn care units, lessons uh, learned from Eastern Central Uganda. Welcome, Philip. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the wonderful pre uh, introduction. Good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Um, 
like uh, the chair said, my name is Philip, and I'm a doctoral student at Calorins Khan Makira University in a double degree program. My presentation is on respectful newborn care in the newborn care units. And I draw lessons from work we've done in Eastern Central Uganda. So this work has been done as part of uh, a, project, a project called ALERT, uh, which hosts my PhD. And I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues, my supervisor, and some of them are my colleagues. Uh, could go to the next slide. Okay, so um, this slide basically shows that uh, in 2020, FIGO put out what they termed as building blocks to guide quality improvement in respect for matern maternity care. They highlight various concepts related to respectful newborn care, though really they are talking about respectful maternity care. And then when we go to the next uh, slide, Uh, more specifically, and more related to what I want to talk about, uh, a few years earlier in 2017, Emma Sachs published a mapping of the typologies of disrespectful care for newborns, I mean, focused really on the newborns, and highlighted various aspects like physical abuse, verbal abuse, uh, discrimination, and stigma, ETC, ETC. Uh, next slide. So um, reflecting on what FIGO has done, what Emma published and all others, all other studies that I, I didn't highlight, it illustrates that various efforts are being made towards developing standards for respectful newborn care, which is still lagging, at least compared to respectful maternal care. So the goal for this talk is to further uh, catalyze the dialogue or the discourse around conceptualizing standards of standards for respectful newborn care. Our focus, unlike others, is we are focusing on the NICU setting, the neonatal care unit setting. And maybe more uniquely, we discuss and reflect on actual experiences of respectful newborn care. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what we did, we conducted in-depth interviews for 18 mothers. We also did observations in the newborn care units. This work is really recent. We collected this data around April, May, and uh, the data was collected in two high volume facilities in Eastern Uganda. Analysis is thematic, and here we really present preliminary findings. Um, Next slide, please. So what, what we found. Now, one of the key highlights in our findings is that mothers are at the heart or the center of quality and respectful care of newborns in the NICU. It is almost impossible to talk about respectful newborn care in the newborn care unit without mothers. Our observations and interviews show that mothers breastfed, cleaned, and many times, due to the NICUs being understaffed, provided clinical care. For example, they were involved in giving oxygen therapy or monitoring the baby's temperature. This is also time for bonding, which we know that it's important for post-discharge care. And we dare to ask mothers why they participated in care. We, we term one of the key responses as a motherhood identity. In other words, it's natural for a mother to care for her baby. Also, uh, taking a rather gender perspective, women are expected to produce and raise babies. So it's, it's really a thing that they own up and the way they see themselves. Also, due to the inadequacies of health system within in the health systems, understaffing of, uh, understaffing of the NICUs, they found themselves doing medical tasks. So um, this is one of the first uh, reflections we've got. Next slide, please. 
All right, so in the next few slides, we highlight some of the key ideas or, or notions that emerge from our analysis and that we see as important in the typology of respectful newborn care in the NICU. This is really from the perspective of mothers who we see as central. Uh, first, mothers valued respect, responsive health providers. This is because in the NICU, babies are sick and often require urgent care. So responsiveness was ranked highly. And, 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 and just the quotations in green show positive and the ones in red are, are negative. In, in this presentation, we generally show extreme positive and extreme negative, but of course, there were many gray ideas. So for the positive, the mother was happy that her baby her baby, when, when the baby convulsed, the health worker responded very fast. For the negative, the mom was not happy because the health worker took, told her she would be coming, but never really came when the baby had an emergency. Next slide. And uh, so because in the NICU, mothers and, mothers and health workers are core providers mothers felt that it was important that they could approach the health workers and talk about the care of their babies. Here we see a 19-year-old who described an approachable health worker as one she could easily ask questions, seek guidance, and this made it easy for her to care for her baby. On the negative, in red, we have a 35-year-old who gives an example that there's no way you can get close to them. She sits and says, bring the baby here, never talks to anyone, sits, writes notes, and goes. And, and the mother said she had a tough face, so she feared to approach her. And next slide. And uh, empathetic care, this is also very much related to being approachable. So a 34-year-old mother describes an empathetic caregiver as one who actively checks on her and her baby and encourages her. It is important to note that most of these mothers are sad and probably have not slept for days. So empathy is so important. Uh, a non-empathetic worker is one who, uh, this one requested the mother to do a certain lab test. And when the mother did not do it for some reason, she told her, sign this form indicating that you have refused my medical care. Uh, this is also borderline blackmail and also could highlight issues of power dynamics between health workers and, and patients. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we also see that the way health workers communicate with mothers is so important in the NICU, uh, typically, um, articles on respectful care focus and many presentations focus on verbal abuse. But in the newborn care unit, we, 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 we see that verbal abuse is not, is not just it, but also the failure to communicate is a big problem and, and has to, is a big problem because mothers need to know what is happening to the baby. Also providing conflicting information was a major issue. But this also happened typically when the baby was severely ill. And of course, understandably, the health workers were trying to figure out the condition of the baby. Meanwhile, the mother's distress levels were high. So that does always that conflict. Then uh, good communication helped legitimize, uh, legitimize painful procedures or difficult decisions. So for example, like this 20 year old, I, want, I wanted to go home early, but they explained to me, so I stayed because this is good for my baby. But, um, and, and then our next slide. So keeping in this communication in, in mind, next slide, please. So also linked to communication, the mother's perspective, mothers generally, who, appreciated the care they received. However, uh, the way they perceived clinical care was linked to bad communication and maybe the lack of skills of health workers. So they found that some procedures were very painful 
and sometimes unnecessary, but this is from the perspective of the mother and not the, the health worker. But again, like I mentioned earlier, that good communication helped legitimize painful procedures, like just explaining why this must be done. So taking off blood, for example, in this 30 year old uh, was you know, seen as negative because they had the baby and sometimes mothers thought that their babies had little blood so they didn't have to take them off for, to do tests. Next slide. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we found that also away from all these quotations, we found that NICUs focus on the baby alone. And this does not make sense because babies need their mothers to thrive. We saw that NICUs have no sleeping areas for mothers, yet they need the mothers to be there to breastfeed them. Moreover, mothers are often equally unwell after birth. Some just had operative birth. Uh, there's no privacy. The cost of food and the cost of living in the NICU was highlighted as a big issue. The idea of spouses and other social support in the NICU was not even conceptualized. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. And then there are also structural barriers to respectful care. For example, lack of supplies, which meant that poor mothers did not necessarily get all the treatment they liked, they would like. So this is also inequality. The NICUs were understaffed and it makes it difficult to provide quality care. Accessing care was also challenging. The congestion, as you can see, it, it, you know, the environment. So you have to sit on those chairs. Then mother, mother's individual characteristics made them more vulnerable. For example, those that were poor, then the social norms. I mean, the specific example here is those who are poor are likely to, you know, when it goes into the power dynamics, they were likely to be bullied more. Those who are poor and those who are less educated. Next slide. Okay, so in our final reflection, we see that there are important the important things to think about as we think as we continue to foment this discussion around respectful newborn care is uh, and and these are things that we see that have not been yet strongly highlighted in the existing typologies a responsive health workers communication the skills of health workers then an environment that enables mothers to participate in the care and beyond mere separation of mother and baby, which is important, but very basic, because we also need mothers to participate in the care of their babies. Then health systems con system conditions can disable uh, respectful care, for example, absence of drugs, exposing poor families. Then expectation, the our key expectation from this work is this work is really preliminary and we're not through with analysis and everything. We are still exploring it. But our goal is to contribute to the discourse around respectful newborn care, including uh, the typology. And next slide. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight where this work is done. It's under the Allied study in the Macquarie Center of Excellence. Uh, next slide. Yes, that, those are the references that I use for this presentation. And I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank, uh, thank, thank you very much, Philip. Thank you very much, you very Philip. Much. And uh, now we shall move into looking at um, the questions that have been posed uh, to our panelists. So we have some questions that have been posed to our panelists and I'm going to be reading them out. Uh, the first question is, um, what does the policy say about the preferred method of delivery where women in pastoral areas prefer the squatting method over the conventional method of delivery practice that health facilities of delivery. I can invite uh, 
Dr. Dr. Felista, to, to answer that. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Carol, for the question. So the Ministry of Health does not dictate in which position a mother should deliver. And even though our delivery beds are made in such a way that mothers are expected to deliver in the lithotomy position, if a mother prefers to deliver in other positions, it is allowed that she should be delivered in that position. And we have had, I think, in the Pokot community, where even the delivery beds have been modified to suit what the community wants. So it's not uh, prescribed in black and white that a delivery shall be conducted in a certain position. So in the semi-arid areas like in Trukana, the healthcare providers should be responsive and be able to deliver a mother who doesn't prefer to deliver in lithotomy position should be supported to deliver in her preferable position. Thank, thank you very much, Daktari. That's a very comprehensive answer. Um, Penina says that this has been excellent work and uh, she hopes it's going to be sustained in those receiving the intervention. It's beautifully researched and action, but we have Simon asking, can depression kill? And if so, what really happens um, without one committing suicide? What is the pathophysiology? So I want to invite uh, Charity um, to ex explain to us what could really happen, you know, could depression kill? Thank you, Dr. Yes, depression can kill. Depression usually starts as a, a condition. Obviously, the cause of depression is not known, although there are some contributing factors that can lead one to depression. For example, uh, family history, also, um, you know, social economic status, uh, that post, uh, makes a person to experience extreme stress leading into depression. When depression occurs, it usually starts as uh, one experiencing some raw moods uh, uh, moving forward and uh, it even takes the events, um, uh, start feeling that they are, they are not worth living. Some would even start uh, self-harm like, you know, you know, using needles to cut themselves, and so cutting their nails, you know, um, piercing some parts of parts of the body, and so on. In the and so on. In the worst case scenario, uh, the these pers persons who constantly is unchecked is not receiving any any support at all. Uh, get feels unworthy. They feel like they are not worthy living. They feel like they are a bother. And it, at, at that point, where now depression can lead into the past themselves, we have seen uh, people committing suicides uh, through various means, and that is how depression kills. The most important part, important thing is for us to check so that we can to check um, in, in the healthcare setting. Let's know ourselves. Let's set an, uh, an environment where. Uh, um, there is openness and you can uh, you can be able to reach out to, to uh, your fellow colleague if you feel very low or if you have uh, so that you don't arrive to uh, that that decision uh, i think that's what we, we found out and i think for the case that we, we report here uh, she's continued to receive or uh, he or she has continued to receive uh, good care and we can say that uh, we we continue to follow and communicate with, with our counselor but they are the uh, the external cancer role has ended, but she continued, she was attached to a health facility uh, where which offers care and hopefully uh, she's being helped. Uh, over to you, Dr. Thank you very much, uh, Charity. Um, I see a question from Chantal Okondo. Hi, Chantal, nice to have you on this Zoom, talking about and asking whether there was a care for small and sick newborns, and, and uh, even for the study done in Kenya, this was also part of the considerations, and these were the guidance that were being used. Uh, but uh, to you, Philip, uh, Christine asks, what has sexual abuse got to do with respectful newborn care in the NCU? 
<laughs> that's uh, so um, well. Sexual abuse was highlighted in in other studies that were mapping uh, abuse, but this does. I think the other studies were really looking at children and our newborns and older children. So for us, this is not one of the things that came out. It's it's. It's not one of our themes that we see. Okay, Philip, but there's, there's a question from Mary and he says, she says, thank you for the very informative presentation, but asks uh, for you to explain the justification of the focus on the zero to 24 year olds and elaborate on effect of mistreatment on the health of newborns and young children, including their health trajectory. So maybe you can answer something on that. Yeah, so we didn't, we, we focused only on babies who go into the newborn care unit. So uh, these are babies usually with birth complications. Uh, many past studies have looked at older children and children in pediatrics world. Um, our kind of unique contribution to the discourse is for babies who are in the NICU specifically. Th thank you, Philip. Um, Dr. Carol, maybe the question was to ask because it's our study that had zero to 24 months. It was not 24 years. So we looked at birth and uh, that was in the postnatal ward, maternity postnatal ward, because the baby arrives in maternity and the mistreatment can start, of the baby can start from inappropriate resuscitation and care of the baby from delivery. So we had our study area in maternity, postnatal ward, newborn unit, and pediatric ward. And the reason why we focused up to the pediatric ward is that most of these newborn units, we have neonates in the pediatric ward, even in KNH here. When a baby is born and they are more than 24 hours old, they'll be at, when they come back uh, or they come from another facility and they are more than 24 hours old, they'll not be admitted to the newborn unit. They'll go to the pediatric ward. So we really wanted to make sure that we capture all the newborn. Plus, remember the first 1,000 days where child development is very important in the first 1,000 days. This baby is, if a baby has sensory, uh, is sens the sensory deprivation in the first two years of life is going to impact on what development they get as they grow. So for us, our parental interventions included not only experiencing the care, but also triggering the parents to interact with their children, to understand them, to talk to them, we had parents who had never even talked to their children. They are just holding the child, they are keeping quiet and we had to come up, teach them how to make locally available toys using plastic plates, tell a, a, a parent to sit down with the child and engage them in play things that will stimulate them to grow that parents are not doing. So that is why for us, we went all the way to the pediatric ward and we really wanted to focus on that part of it. if a baby or an infant is getting responsive care, stimulating them and interacting to them to really make sure that they develop well was part of our intervention. Thank you and over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari, for that very you know, clear explanation. as a major unit and subject. And this is just in line with what Dr. Ari is saying here, communication really for the providers, but even how we train the caregivers to communicate with their children. Um, Charity, Cheryl is asking, you know, how did you do the intervention with the providers? You mentioned group and one-on-one -on -one sessions, but you'd really want to hear a bit more detail of what it included and how many sessions. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, for the provider inter intervention, we first of all trained uh, mentors, uh, two to three mentors from each of the study facilities. Those, we had five study facilities. 
and you train them on the nurturing care aspect. We also train them on the emotional aspect, both the provider uh, emotional aspect and also uh, for her, the emotional support for the parents. And also, we also, uh, it, you know, showed them how to use job aids and, and, and so on. And part of this job is actually was, were, were developed with them. Uh, uh, focusing on the emotional support, uh, uh, intervention or, on, on um, uh, providers' mental wellness, uh, we, we would first of all have a group counseling where providers would be in, in, uh, invited voluntarily to attend a group counseling session. Uh, like I said, we started virtually because of, of, of COVID. And just to let you know that the very first sessions we had, there were very few people. But I think uh, those that attended, they went back and informed their fellow colleagues. And uh, as the time progressed, uh, they became very, very popular. Now, from the group counseling sessions, uh, 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 the, the, the external counselor, we had both the external counselor and some facilities also had uh, someone who is trained in, in counseling, particular facilities in Bugoma and uh, Bugoma County. So what would happen is uh, after using uh, a, counseling, a group counseling tool uh, uh, by the uh, external counselor, uh, she would end up the session by saying, if you need more, more to talk more, or uh, you know about your issues, please reach out to me. Or uh, some would be, uh, you know, ask uh, upfront that I need to get more information. And we received quite a number of of, of providers. Some, uh, you know, uh, you know, dealing with the family issues. Some dealing with the work-related issues, a quite range of, of problems that the providers were dealing with. And in total, we had about uh, seven, um, about seven providers that required, uh, you know, intensive one-on-one -on -one session from those group, from the group counseling. And uh, some were uh, uh, the external counselor was able to handle a few of them, like three of them. But uh, other, but uh, either uh, had uh, issues like, uh, you know, uh, depression or you know, addiction uh, problems were linked to, to the to the facilities. That is how uh, it, it it worked. Facilities continued uh, with the with the, um, the 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 intervention through their own resources where the, the counselor is available. And even perhaps Dr. Guno can say that Nairobi County, for example, has posted, uh, you know, uh, identified people in each of the sub counties to be dealing with provider issues. And I think this is uh, one of the projects that contributed to, to identifying, you know, uh, key providers that are trained on, with, on mental health to deal with provider issues. Uh, because I think that was was identified as a need. Uh, I, I hope that answers you. Over to you, Dr. Kano. Yes, uh, Charity, uh, thank you uh, for that. And uh, yes, in Nairobi, we are doing that sort of support to the providers and that continuous um, engagement that we have institutionalized now, particularly in the larger facilities, which are dealing with the uh, newborns. Um, and just looking still on the wall, uh, Athana says he works in a refugee setup and would wish to keep this conversation at this level as well. And I think one of his asks here is for training material guidelines for these purposes to cascade the knowledge and skills. Uh, some publications have come out of this work and we should be able to share uh, these links uh, with the administrators so that as they are loading the presentations, you are able um, to also read uh, and see how you can work and implement some of uh, these uh, materials in your setup. Um, again, Rose says that uh, this work is well researched, well presented, and hoping that it will reach all those who work with sick children, you know, not just in the NBUs or the NICUs. Uh, but you know, in the in the in the facilities. Um, again, I know Florence is trying to explain the issue around sexual abuse um, uh, and and some of the issues uh, that could contribute in your natural care. And talks about sexual harassment. You you find mothers getting pregnant when they still have a newborn, and this contributes 
uh, to some of the neglect. I think we can all just look at that. But just uh, to pose an answer to the uh, Kenya team, and, and I can see that uh, Emma Sachs was talking about how do we account for structural issues, and particularly she highlights the issue of healthcare workers not having enough stuff that leads to disrespectful care. And I see that Philip from Uganda has tried to answer that and saying this is one of their goals, but uh, maybe just asking um, uh, Dr. Makwa, really in Kenya, what, what are some of, what, what could we do? Uh, how could we account for some of these issues uh, that will lead to disrespectful care, even as we wind up, Dr. Ari? Thank you, Dr. Karo. Our biggest challenges has been issues around staffing. There are a lot of our newborn units are staff shortage, especially the nursing staff. Nursing staff is the core of newborn care in the newborn unit. The clinicians come do round and go and the nurses are there most of the time with the babies. So we've really been advocating for improvement in the nursing staff numbers within our newborn unit and just making sure that every year we really make, uh, we account for those who are retiring, the natural attrition. But even with that, the numbers are still few. Even in the national hospital here, the staffing levels are still few. And a staff who is overworked is more likely not to give good quality of care and is likely going to have poor interaction between between the provider and the, and the nurses. So we really, the scenarios are so many where even sometimes a mother comes and it's not feeding time and they're told go back, he will come back when the next feeding time. She has just had a cesarean section, she has walked up the stairs, you arrive then you're told, next feeding time is 3 p.m. You have come at two, right now I'm doing my ward work. So, all these things have to be improved. And as for us as child advocates, we are advocating for improvement. Involving the key stakeholders is very important so that also the management understands that improvement of the staff numbers will also help to improve the quality of care. Equipment is another challenge. We have our babies sharing incubators, sharing baby cots. That is disrespectful care because how do you feel even you when you deliver and you go to a hospital and your baby is sharing with another baby whom you don't know, whom you don't know is being treated of what? And when we did the formative stage in Bungoma, there was a lot of sharing of babies sharing courts, and it came out as one of the areas where parents really felt that that is not respectful newborn care. If you are sharing phototherapy, sharing incubators. So really we have to work on our infrastructure, human resource in order for us to work on that. But even with the current limited one, staff attitude and communication also has to improve. And the way to do it is we have to really get feedback from our providers through exit service, through uh, uh, patient feedback forms, just letting them give us feedback. What can we improve on the low lying fruits that you don't need to put in a lot of resources to improve? Just talking to a mother and giving them support will go a long way in improving the experience of care that newborns and parents go through. Thank you and over. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Um, and I like one word that she said, advocacy. So I think it's for all of us who are on this uh, you know, webinar to stand up as child advocates, to speak about improvement in quality of care, to do work around um, finding out what are some of the barriers, to support caregivers, but also support providers. Uh, Kenya has tried, um, has launched our, you know, uh, our task shifting guidelines. What are some of the issues around there that could uh, address staff shortages? And also some of these tasks that could be taken up a bit. And I think from Uganda, we've heard of the caregivers doing some 
tasks, some sort of task shifting happening. So it's to explore such approaches and see whether they are beneficial to the newborns and try in, a, in generally to, you know, see how we can improve uh, quality care for the newborns and the children within our hospital. So I want to appreciate all our presenters today, uh, Dr. Makoha, Charity and Philip for the great work and great presentations. And now hand back the meeting to Agnes, even as we close, Dr. Agnes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, of our presenters, for that, uh, for those very insightful presentations and for the work that has gone in uh, for respectful care. We really do appreciate to our attendees. Thank you for staying with us till the end. Uh, we welcome you for the next sessions. Have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.